side to the other to unnerve the driver. The pressure on Phil White now must be almost irresistible. If ever a man was in the hot seat, it's Phil White. Coming right into the closing stages now, there's just one more lap to go, and we're really coming to it now, and the pressure has got to go on. If George Polly's going to do it, he's got to do it now. This is the final straight, and over the line they go, and George can't get past. He has to settle for that second place. The finish there of the 1988 World Hot Rod Final. Hello again, welcome to Wheels. Here now is the World Final again, 1989 vintage. Well, last year it was a great battle between George Polly and Phil White in the rain. This year there's already been some upsets and drama before the start, but that's the main course. Let's have a couple of appetizers first, and one of them involving a blast from the past, Barry Lee is back. Barry, we, we thought you'd have too many commitments, and in fact that you couldn't get down from the commentary box to the racetrack quick enough, but why are you back in this particular race? This takes me back about 14 or 15 years when Hot Rodding first started, Jerry. It's, it's the 1600 formula where they're not allowed racing tyres. You can overtake on the outside, and the last programme on wheels is such, such an exciting race. I actually said to everybody how exciting it was. Of course, all the drivers have got together and said, here is a barrel of rubbish, that guy never goes. So here I am sitting here at the back of the grid in the barrel of rubbish. But how much driving have you done in this car? How much testing? Uh, three minutes. <laughs> but there you go. So and it's going to be fun. Do you think it will last? I don't know, I, don't, I think the car might last, I don't think I will. <laughs> well, an ever optimistic Barry Lee, he's got a lot to do in this one, but uh, for this first ever World Championship in this formula, who's going to come out on top? Well, the guys who are right down at the very front have got a very good uh, chance, and uh, right on pole position we've got car number 451, Dave Storey. The chequered roof indicates that he's the reigning British champion and starting at that position on the grid he's obviously got a very very good chance indeed. A man who we saw on the wheels program just a few weeks ago was Dave Willis from Slough in Buckinghamshire on car number 665. Now he's a little bit further back but he I think we can rely on being in there at the finish. Starting Marshall Poise now on the rostrum and we are underway. What a roar as they go into that first turn. And uh, 161, Alan Grantham from Chichester. Former star man racing as a yellow top at the moment. That's only the second grader driver. Uh, getting a very early start. And 57, the current uh, top point scorer and East Anglian champion, Alan Dent, is well up there. And there in our car with a radio link is 351, Barry Lee. How's it going early on, Barry? Yes, yeah, it's terrific, Nigel. The cars are slipping everywhere. There's hundreds of them about. All time to go back towards the fence now. Going down the outside, this turn in front of me. I'm going to go back to the inside now. The car in front of me, it says, Mind back and kick hands. I'll slide down. I've got one on the outside of me now. I'll put him right there. Push this cake cans, always oh, touch his brakes, always oh, got the other one sideways. Over to you now, Mars, it's getting a bit hectic. OK, Barry obviously enjoying himself very, very much indeed, but he's a long way down the field. We'll uh, watch his progress there. It's got 351 on the side and 22 on the roof. Just to confuse you, back up at the front of this race, it's Alan Dent now who hits the front in the 57 car with 451 Dave Storey in second place. 161, Alan Grantham is third. 43, Colin Strudwick is fourth. Now there we are, there's the leader, just gone out of the picture there. One, two, three, four, five, six on the inside, there's four, five, one. You can spot him by that check and roof. Just taking the inside line, going down, oh, the door closed on him there, behind number three. Barry Lee, as you can see, three, five, one, is just tucked in behind him. Tracking the second place, man, maybe Barry's going to try and uh, stay with him there, but of course, Barry's been lapped, so uh, he's a long, long way behind. 161 is still running third. 665 Dave Willis, who won the Wheels International Championship uh, just a few weeks ago on the programme, is uh, back in fourth place. 78 uh, comes in the next place, Colin Gong. But it's 57, still Alan Dent, the clear leader. We're into the final stages now, five more laps to go. 665 Dave Willis is in fact fourth. 78, Colin Gong is fifth. Barry Lee, uh, a little bit further back, not really in contention, but he's certainly enjoying himself in the traffic there. Most of those cars, like him, are back markers and have been lapped by the first, certainly the first two, maybe three cars. But Barry's still having fun, just about to be passed by the uh, 98 car of Peter Holsworth from Attleborough. 
So there we are, but uh, while that's going on, this is the man who is looking all set to take this uh, world championship. 57, Alan Dent, he's been around a long time, raced the National Hot Rods, and then came uh, down in engine size to this new formula. There's 451, British champion, who I don't think today is going to add the world tag to that British title. I know he would like to very much, but he isn't going to make it. Dave Willis in 665 is back in fourth place, the wheels champion. 161 still holding third. Uh, Barry Lee is in trouble on the far side. I see Barry Lee slowed right down and uh, cruising along the fence. A bit of smoke coming from the back of the car. But as he goes over the line, it's 57, Alan Dent, who takes this world title by really quite a long, long way. The second place man's coming off the turn now. Here he comes. 4-5-1. Dave Storey is going to get to the second. 161 comes through for third, and 665 Dave Willis has to settle for fourth place. But no doubt about the winner, the new Kent Cams Hot Rod World Champion is Alan Dent. Seems a, an emotional moment for both of you. Well, we've been trying to win uh, a big championship for a long time in the Nationals, and obviously I've been up the top of the points in this formula since we moved over to it. Finally, it's come good, and you just don't know what it feels like. I'm just choked. What's it feel like for you? Oh, I'm just choked. <laughs> What about young Alan? Where was he? I think he finished and I think he'd be happy. But, but he was only, long he's only his second year. Um, and he was finding it hard to start with. He's getting better and he's made me proud anyway, you know. But this is one for the parents at the moment. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah, we can retire later on and happy now. <laughs> Thank you. There you go, the first win of the day and a very emotional one for Alan Dent of Abbots Langley. Second was Dave Storey of Beckles. Alan Grantham of Chichester third, Dave Willis of Slough fourth, and in fifth place, Colin Gom of Chessant. Right, let's move on now to saloon stock car racing, the traditional form of stock car racing, where the bumpers are definitely not there just for decoration, and where the England-Scotland routine is sure to add a little bit to the aggro. Away we go. Well, Jerry Harrison rather wisely decides to get out of the way because I think that could be a smart move. Now then, let's see who's going to be up front when this is all over. 156 Ray Gowdy is always in with a shout and you certainly can't discount the 76 car of Adrian Q, second in the points chart behind Ray Gowdy and he's going to go like mad in this one as well. The trouble start early on for the 77 car of uh, Steve Davis. He gets spun out before things really even get underway. But that's the way it is with saloon stocks. Anything goes and the lads really like to get stuck in quick and fast. So let's try and uh, let them settle down for a moment or two, then we'll pick up some leaders. Oh, one of the inside track market tires rolling around, I see, and causing a little bit of mayhem up on that top turn. Through they go, out onto the speedway track, no problems at all, just push them if necessary. It. You just come off the speedway track and just rejoin the race. That's all you have to do. We're looking at 124, I think, is the leader, or is it 174? Once, once, yeah, 174. Trevor Titchmas, I think, is the leader. There he goes, and going nicely. Oh, that's a one way to go. That's Dean Wood, the world champion, 302. Um, he's, uh, it, most recent excursions were uh, sort of into the fence and onto the green with the Scotsman and uh, it may well be that the Scotsman alongside him there, 1-5-1, one, one, Bob Jones is going to do just that. And uh, Dean Jones has got his come up and it's very fast indeed. So we'll have to see whether he comes out of the fence to fight another day. But uh, there was an early clash uh, with our friends from north of the border. Meanwhile, 174 with four laps gone is the leader. 124, I think, is in second place, uh, Peter Lane. We'll have to see in a moment or two. Dean Wood is still in the fence, so I think that's going to be the yes. In fact, Dean Wood, I can see, is getting out, so that's the end of the race for 302, I'm afraid. So the Anglo Scottish conflict will not be continued in that particular quarter. Right, let's get back to the uh, race itself. 174, Tre Trevor Titchmarsh. To, uh, Ian Jarman has now moved up into second place. So I think it's 174 and 490 are the first two. Yes, in fact, uh, 490 is making his presence felt very much indeed on that rear bumper. And as soon as he gets a chance to do a bit of hooking or a bit of pushing, I think we shall see things happen now. 
174 is given way, which uh, for a yellow grey driver perhaps is wise because 490 is a blue top and uh, certainly seems to be very determined. So he's through and up into the lead. That's the leader, 490. Ian Jarman from Boston has now taken it up. 174 has gone down to second and 124 is in third place, Peter Lane. So there we are, we've got 490 at the front of that little group. Just got to get 181 out of the way. Nice little gap opens up on the inside and he skittles through quite conveniently. 27 there is a back marker, so we don't have to worry too much about him uh, because he's out of it anyway. He is now. <laughs> You're right. So that's our lead car. All on his own at the moment, nobody hassling him too much. We've got a flat near side front tyre, the lead car has got a flat near side front tyre. Oh, yes, 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 that's going to cause some problems and there. A, and, a, and he's also got a dent in his offside rear wing, but the rest of the car is quite good. <laughs> he certainly has got a dent for two. It's amazing how well that's going in for the pump jump. It's not the right wheel though, isn't it? Well, he's got four more, isn't he? Three row wheels and one steering wheel, and that's all these crazy guys seem to think about. Oh, look, and here one comes up the back. Ray Gowdy now coming to join him, or want to join him, to actually get rid of him and to come sweeping through. So I think probably Ray Gowdy may well have now taken it up. Let's look at the sheets. Uh, I don't know that he has, in fact. They may be looking at 591 is in there, 124 is going as well, 226 is going. There's 139 has ground to a halt, I'm afraid. That's Kevin Smith. So with 13 laps gone, 13 gone, it's Jeff Morris now in 591 who is the leader. There's 116. He's still second. 438 is third. 124 is next. This is a couple of them further back. Ray Gowdy not going too well in this. Uh, that's the Ray Gowdy being lapped by the leader there. 156, the silver top, national points champion, being lapped by the leader in this race. So obviously race car perhaps suffering a little uh, after effects from some of the earlier races. So there we are on the lap sheets of this 30 lap race. We've got, uh, oh, I beg your pardon, it's a 25 lap race. So we've only got five more laps to go. Five more laps to go and there goes 116. Through on the inside, 438 and 126 coming to join them in all in a big push as we go into the final stages. Everyone really applying the pressure now, so let's have a little look. 438 is there, 116 is still in there. It's 116 and 438, that's the battle between these two. Oh, 438 has spun out. That was superb, 126, Willie, 126, Willie Barnes does uh, Dickie Smith a great favour, gets rid of the opposition and leads. 116 in the lead with three more laps to go. So that's 126, who's uh, some way back. This is the guy who's now taking it up. There's 116. Two more to go. No real challenge now to Dickey. He's a good uh, 40 yards clear of uh, 591 in second place and a 124 in third. So well, that's the gap between first and second. The one lap marker is out. This is the leader on his last lap now. He's just got to run down this final straight into the last turn, and the 1989 Golden Helmet is going to go to Dickie Smith. This is it. Over the line he comes, and it's a win for Dickie in car number 116. Second man home is going to be car number 591. Jeff Morris from Reading, and third is 438, Tony Lay from Needham Market. Right, there are the confirmation of the final placings then. Another victory for 18-year-old Diggy Smith of Pullham St Mary, Jeff Morris of Reading second, Tony Lay and Needham Market third, Peter Lane of Sudbury fourth and fifth, Simon Webb of Long Melford. Well, you might be fairly familiar with the old routine that the men make the mess and the women do the clearing up. Well, that happens sometimes here at Foxhall because among the recovery drivers is June Hudson from Hunstanton. June, how long have you been involved in this little game? About two years. I gather it was your boyfriend who dragged you into it. That's right, yes. Tell me the circumstances.
circumstances? Well, um, he just said one day, you're going to drive it, and that was it. I was driving it. Well, what are you uh, during the week? Uh, hairdressing. It's a little bit different from hairdressing, isn't it? The, the, the whole involvement. Very much. More fun doing this, though. You think so? <laughs> yes. Right, at this stage of the proceedings, we are now turning very serious indeed, and we're thinking in terms of destruction. As you know, we're with a strange breed here. They spend hours constructing these beautiful things. A lot of effort, a lot of consideration, and in a few moments, they will be, I'm afraid, in pieces. The theme, if you hadn't guessed, is a summer holiday. Mixed with that, I'm sure, there's a certain amount of vino collapso. Away we go. All I can say is that Jerry Harrison, complete with funny hat, but have got out of that caravan by now, because if not, he's going to be in for the ride of his life. There's no question. They look relatively, well, tidy, shall we say, at the moment. I think the scene here at Foxhall Heath will resemble the end of a epic World War II battle in about ten minutes' time. Nigel, they're actually throwing things at them now. Yes. They're That's being... not fair. Oh, they're being pelted now. Some of them haven't even started, and 666 has already got a problem. Oh, look, there's the bodywork entirely disappearing on that one, and that one. Oh, and that one, and another one. Oh, they don't last very long, do they? London Transport forcing his way... To... Oh, this, one's... this one is still relatively intact. Yes. Uh, there's a slight blockage by the pit gate. Yes, can we have some technical information about this, please? Yes, I've got, I've got Barry Lee alongside me, who is uh, my technical consultant. Yes. Would you like to give me the expert's point of view on Yes, this? you have to remove the brain. Oh, look, this is good. He's nice and neat. Yes, I don't really know. It's going to be what's going to be aiming for him at the moment. He's coming down the main straight now. Is he going to miss this lot? Come on, look, he's got all that track and he even hits one. Oh, that's the new folding type of caravan there. You can see that's being dragged around by the red one. Oh, that's classic. That's the low line look. Yes. Yes. Oh, look, it's getting lower. Yes, it's, it's wearing sinking. down. It's sinking, my God, it's going down. I hope Jerry's not in there because I have short legs. Oh, my God. I don't believe it. Robert's been hit. Oh, that's it. Lean him over. Yes. Crunch and Nick's been crunched by Willie. And Gary. There's oh, people standing up on the top of it and the race is still on. They're clearing the rubbish away. I don't away. believe it. Don't ask me who's winning, because this is supposed to actually be a race. Let me look at the lap oh, for the first time. <laughs> There's a transit loaded itself on the back of an escort. I think that's Looks it. Like I it. think they're calling it a day. I'm assuming, after all this little lot, that 210 Terry Harris is there is going to be uh, determined to be the winner yeah. of this year's <laughs> Van Banger caravan race. Well, I'm afraid it might take us a couple of minutes to sort this little lot out, but when we do, we should be right back with more of the same, but a little bit faster. See you in a minute. <laughs> Lucasade with the great taste of real orange juice and barley. Lucasade, orange barley. <laughs> for safety can't be exciting. The new Volvo 440, a car that changes the rules. Take a 
too long to have the place completely shipshape again. Uh, places like Lord's Cricket Ground and at Twickenham they occasionally have ample young ladies doing a bit of entertainment streaking. What do we get here at Foxhall? The oil and mud routine. All good, clean fun, so long as you don't have to take him home. Now we can prepare for the big one. You can fasten your seatbelts. This is the 1989 World and National Hot Rod Final. The competitors here have gone a long and perhaps not winding road, certainly a long way around a few oval tracks to qualify for this one. Let's have a look at some of the favourites. There's Mick Duffy Collard, car number 19, a Mazda with a new engine. Mick's the 1980 world champion, and he's back in this formula after a year's absence. Neil Facey, car number four from Horning in Norfolk. He's never done much in previous world finals, but he's just won three major titles, so he's on a high at the moment. Another former champion in the lineup, Peter Grimer, car number 88. He's switched to a Fiesta this season. The Irish are always a force here. Ormond Christie, number 962 from Crumlin, the only driver other than Barry Lee to have won the world title more than twice. His fellow countryman Norman Woolsey is here too. Five children, four grandchildren, and three times in the top three here, and he's on the front row of the grid. You always expect George Polly to be one of the favourites. Car number 306 from East Sussex, world champion 1976-1987. Narrowly beaten here last year, but he had a bad crash in qualifying yesterday. Well, I feel sort of run down and no energy and drained really, but I didn't have an awful lot to eat yesterday before that happened because it had been a busy day. Um, I'm picking up pieces now and I think give us another 40 minutes we'll be back in shape. I've got the old tea on the go here you see. <laughs> but apart from the injuries to yourself because I gather you were unconscious for some time I was taken to hospital, yeah, your car's a write off. This one, yeah, I think this one has bit the dust. This is a car we used, well la we used last year for the world final. Very successful in the rain and it has been going extremely well this year. So we dobbed right out on that, but I'm lucky. I, I was going to build a new car as a backup for this, and I never got round to it. So one of the chaps local to us, we've been helping him build a car, and we brought it up here in kit form in case we needed it, and they've worked all night, and they're working wonders with it now. The thing is virtually, well, we've had a go in it. Barry's had a go in it. He cheated because he had to test a mic, so it gave us another couple of laps of practice, so we used that one. <laughs> um, I think it'd be all right, you know. Get your fingers crossed, though. Well, the number one here in most people's minds is Phil White of Middlesex, car number 63, last year's winner, driving a brand new Toyota Starlet. Phil, you didn't have to go through a lot of the qualifying rounds, but you chose to. Why'd you do that? Just to find out who's racing well and who's not, what line they're taking. So today, hopefully, I'll have the edge. There's been a lot of aggro between you and George Polly. Why is that particularly? Well, we're both going for it, and when you're both going for it, you, you, you've got to have a little bit of that. It all helps, and it's only fun. Only fun, but they say you're, you're quite a tough driver out there. Yeah, so is George. To add a little foreign flavour, there are Continental and South African drivers. 75 laps. Let's join commentators Barry Lee and Nigel King. And away goes the control car then, taking them on the two warming up laps to get those tyres warmed and ready to give them optimum grip. Two laps nice and easily around the circuit. Well, Jerry talked about a long and somewhat tortuous route to get here. It's certainly been that through six qualifying rounds and two semi-finals. In those rounds, the drivers scored points for their various places and it was the top group of point scorers that in fact came through to the heats that were run here at Ipswich yesterday. Each of the drivers had two races. Uh, from the first race, the starting order was reversed for the second one, and then the points that they scored from those determined their grid positions for today's big race. So that's a slight departure from normal. In most of the previous years, the starting positions have been determined by lap times held on the Sunday morning. And indeed, uh, there was great drama in one of those in Boone Beach yesterday. For those of you that are superstitious, it was race 13. There were 13 cars in it, and on lap 13, car 413 blew his engine, oil went all over the track, and all the cars piled in, and that's where George Polly got into his major problems. But uh, George, as you've heard, is repaired and is out there and raring to go. Now, the control car comes off. They've just got this one bend to go. It's important they get a good start, that they're in the right gear and ready to go. A good start, yes, but Neil Facey lost his first gear, so he's going to have to start in second gear. That's going to be a problem. They're off now, running Nigel. Yeah, Neil Facey in the number four car on the outside. 
uh, has to drop in to take second place as the Irishman goes straight into the lead, 9-5-0, Norman Woolsey, the leader, straight off that first bend, with number six, uh, Stephen Dance is in second place, 0-7, Mark Jones is third. In fourth place at the moment, it's another Irishman, the 9-9-4 car of Keith Martin. Behind him is four, Neil Facey. Then we go back to Nigel Smith in 1-3-4, former world champion 962 Ormond Christie, and here's Sir George Polly in that car, hastily put together overnight. 306 George Polly starting a long way back on the grid. He's got a lot of work to do. And here's the shot that in fact uh, we got from Phil White's car. This is the 63 defending title holder, and uh, he's just tucked in there. Let's have a look. He's right behind 962 and 994. That's, in fact, Ormond Christie's car right in front of him. Barry. World champion behind and an ex-world champion there. Ormond Christie's braking very, very early for the corner there. As you can see, his brake lights are coming on halfway down the straight. That will unnecessary, unsettle uh, uh, Phil White's car that's behind him. He's doing that on purpose. He's very early on in the race now. Actually, he's getting a little bit untidy there. The tyre's got... He's going for the inside line. No, the tyre just just dropped his nose off. OK, well, there's the problems that Phil White is facing in defending this title. Uh, he's uh, had to start fairly well back after the difficulties in that restarted race in which the crash featured. He was one of the survivors, but uh, he's a long, a long way back at the moment. We'll go back and have a look at him a little later. But this uh, up at the front of the race is still uh, Norman Woolsey in 9.50, going beautifully. Number six, Stephen Dance from Reading. One of the few drivers, in fact, running a Volkswagen engine, the VW engine, the Golf engine in that number six car, as indeed is Neil Facey. So there's the first uh, three cars. 950, Norman Woolsey, number six, Stephen Dance. 07, Mark Jones, number four, Neil Facey. Number four, number seven there, Mark Jones. He's going for second place there, behind. There he goes, he's going round the outside there now, the number six car. He's trying for second for second place. He's in the Sunny Howard built car there, going very, very quickly. That's got the full power engine in Nigel. OK, so we've got uh, Ford against Volkswagen here. Volkswagen, the Wessex Volkswagen engine uh, in the number six car of Stephen Dance. And as you heard Barry say, Ford powered for Mark Jones in 07. So we've got Norman Woolsey in 950. Uh, about 20 yards clear now of this little group of three cars contesting second, third and fourth. Six, zero, seven and four. We then go back uh, quite a gap to 134, Nigel Smith. 63, uh, Phil White has in fact now got to ahead of Norman Walls of uh, Norman Christie. And now that's the back end of the 134 car that we're seeing as uh, Phil White comes up to try and challenge him. It's very important, I think you'd agree, Barry. Oh, who started a long way back to make up ground and get past some of these slower cars uh, early on. It's a 75 lap event, but of course it's amazing how the laps do go ticking by. We've already got 12 laps under our belt now, with Phil White here in 63 very closely tracking the uh, back end of the 134 Nigel Smith car. Here's uh, George Polly in 306, right up behind another former champion, uh, Mick Collard in number 19. Mick Collard, the number 19 car, has actually brought Formula One tyre technology to the racing this year, Nigel. He was wearing these warmers and they, they warm the tyres up before the race. They're like a big blanket they put around the tyres. That's why he's going quickly from the off. So he's got that little bit of an edge. Maybe those tyres are a little warmer than the rest of them. George Polly, a little nudge on the back end. Considering George was unconscious when they pulled him out of the car after that crash in that uh, heat yesterday, and he spent quite a few hours in hospital, but insisted on coming back to race today, and it doesn't seem to have affected him too much. The, uh, all the verb and all the skill and all the nerve seem still to be there, but he's got a mammoth task. Don't let's uh, forget that. 306, George Polly going well, but still a long way back. Up in the front, 9.50, Norman Woolsey from Porter Down in Northern Ireland, the 1986 champion, immaculate paintwork job there, sponsored by Royal Mail. I don't know whether that's the best of sponsors to have, because I suppose even if you're a first-class driver, there's no promise you'll arrive even the next day. I'll drink to that. Norman Woolsey going beautifully past the slower 413 car, the cause of all the problems in the accident yesterday. Here's the battle for the other places, still number six, Stephen Dance from Reading holding second place, 07. Mark Jones is next, and then four Neil Facey. And here now joining that little group is that uh, immaculate car. You can spot it very easily, the gold roof. And 
and uh, the black and white checkers of the defending title holder, Phil White. And here's the view from inside that car as he comes to challenge for the fourth place. Yes. He's gone on the inside now. He's on the inside. He's got one car on the outside. And now he's trying to hold that car on the outside there, Nigel. As you can see, the keeper's motor on. He's coming up behind the number seven car, which has been being held up by the number six car. But Phil now should go to the left-hand side of the circuit. Stay out left. He squeezes the other car off. As you can see, he's now on the outside. He should be able to keep going wide now, coming out of that turn. Squeeze him up against the wall. That's what he's done to Neil Facey. And he should now try and go around the outside of the number seven car. Well, there's a uh, immaculate move there. He's moved up one more place. In fourth place now, defending height to title holder Phil White, but going very, very well. While all this is going on, don't worry about the leader. He's still there and uh, still some way clear. An immaculate car, 950, Norm Wilsey from Porter Down. And he is now something like 50 yards clear of the little group that is battling out for the rest of these places. There's the leader, 950. In second place, it's still number six, then 07, then 63, and then four. Then a little gap to 134, Nigel Smith, and 962, Ormond Christie. But this is a real scrap now for second, third, fourth, and fifth places. And one by one, the defending title holder, Phil White, seems to be disposing of them. Here's George Polly, just about to, to try and take Mick Collard. George the man, never afraid to go around on the outside. Has he got that extra grip to get round and just take his road in front? Looks as if he's got him. Yes, he's got the legs on him, coming off the bend. So George Polly moves up another place. George now, as I look at the lap sheets, must be up into something like about 10th place, I should think. But he's a long way behind Norman Wolsey in 9.50, who is still about 50 yards clear of the pack that are chasing very, very hard indeed. But the Irishman has got things very much his own way. He must be feeling pretty confident, Barry. He's feeling things. pretty confident, Nigel, but he's just popped in a 14.99. That's one of the quickest times around this particular oval here. He's going very, very well. As the advert says for Peugeot, you can take my breath away. Well, yes, about the Peugeot too. He was telling me uh, before the meeting that uh, he was very pleased to, in fact, use the Peugeot. He's had a bit of his oh. car. Number seven, Mark Jones there, in that little squeeze. Oh, oh it had an insult to injury. George Polly goes in. Uh, Peter Grimer goes in there as well. One after the other, they pile in. 701 is in there, uh, and we've got a red flag to stop it. 994, another Irishman is in there. That's unfortunate. Well, this is basically how it all happened. We'd got this group of four battling away as they had been for some laps for this uh, second, third, fourth place. 63 is on the inside, 07 on the outside. And as they come off the turn, it's 63 who drifts wide, taking Mark Jones in the 07 car out to the concrete. And that clip against the concrete is enough to put him sideways across the track. And of course, the rest of the field coming through had no option but just to run virtually straight into that car. And here comes George straight off the bend. 306 George Polly goes straight in first. And then there's two for the rest of the outside cars. The smoke coming from the front tires of poor old Peter Grimer with his brakes locked in. And two more tucked in behind. Of course, no option but all to run right one into the other. And that's going to be the end of the race for most of them. Peter, what was your version of what happened there? I never see. Well, I come out of the bend and I see them just sort of scuffling and everything. I hit my brakes and I got a car, sort of shoved me up the backside, so I had to go in as well, like, because he just shoved me straight on, so I don't know really what did happen. George, we meet again. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's the condition of you and the car? Well, basically, I've got a bruise on my arm this time. I've got the old heads thumping a bit, like I've got a hangover, but I haven't really. Um, but the car, the new one, I've damaged it considerably. We won't be able to make it for the restart. We want to doze on it and pull it out. But it will go again, but it's a shame on such a brand new car you know, get a packet so early on. You've had some Richard luck. What was your interpretation of what happened there? I came round the bend and I'd negotiated to go by somebody and I'd come into full, full sight of the straight um, for the first time on that, that incident. Right? And suddenly there was, uh, what's his name, Jonah was sitting in the middle of the uh, track and I, oh no, and I hit the brakes but I couldn't stop quick enough to avoid myself hitting him. I think actually he came out as I come along and he was there. and. Uh, then the others come up the inside. I think it was Pete Grimer and uh, I don't know who else. Like the train come up the inside and we all jammed up in a nice little pile. <laughs> Is anybody blaming anybody else? I don't think so, but I think the original culprit will come out later who originally put Jonesy in that situation because Jones is moaning like mad about him. So well, whether they'll... Oh, I didn't say that, did I? I mean, me and Phil got a truce at the moment. So I don't know, it, it, it could be, but... but was it Phil White? It was. I didn't see it. I'm only going on what he said. And if, if what he says is so, then 
perhaps head might, heads might roll a little bit. I don't know. I didn't see it, but it, you know, it's happened, and I'm out of it. He's out of it, and about four others are out of it, which is a shame, you know. Phil, what was your version of happened there? Uh, not quite sure at the moment. I'm a little bit under pressure. Yeah, okay. Good luck. Well, all the mayhem has uh, subsided, at least momentarily. The damaged cars have uh, been removed. There's quite a few now out on that centre green, I'm afraid. The cars have been lined up again in the order as per the lap sheet on lap 28, which is when that incident happened, so we've still got another 37 laps to go to complete this race. So we've got 950, who's been leading virtually from the beginning, Norman Woolsey up front. Tucked in behind him, we've got the number six car of uh, Stephen Dance. Bill White is now in uh, third place in the 63 car. Then Neil Facey in number four. Behind him, uh, Nigel Smith in 134. Then 962, Ormond Christie. Then uh, 718, Colin White. The 800 car of Jock Burgoyne from Scotland. That's the first uh, few now in the long crocodile coming around this top bend. The control car is already off the track. And as they come onto the straight, the flag will go down to resume this uh, National Hot Rod World Championship. swing of things and get the adrenaline flowing again. To what extent, Barry, is this sort of a break uh, an interruption to your concentration? And how damaging can that be to a driver, having to have this pause just when you're at your peak of concentrate conversation? I think you can switch off and switch straight back on. It's, it's good for these first two or three cars because they didn't actually see the accident. The people that were involved in just missing that last accident, which is the cause of the stoppage, that can actually affect them. But Alban Christian is lying in about fifth or sixth place now. He's got a good chance of coming through. We're now following the third place car who is Phil White that I believe did actually have something to do with that accident and he's actually got to get past that, that uh, car in front of him to try and catch Walsley. OK, let's see just uh, how he can do that and there it indeed got comes. Yeah, six is wide and there's the chance. The door is open and of course Neil Facey goes through with him and so 63 now, Phil White shot through. A nice piece of driving, Barry. What a terrific clean piece of driving this time by Phil White. And now we've got a race on our hands. You've got the lead car in the top part of your screen there. You've got Phil White, something like about 20 yards behind. And he's really going to have to go because you've got the crafty number four car behind him. There's the lead car and there's Phil White's car. Right, that's the ground that's got to be made up. That's the target now for Phil White. As we bring you this live picture, here's the overtaking manoeuvre. The six car goes slightly wide coming out. He uh, moves to the outside a little too early. Of course, Phil White's ready. He seems to have got that bit of acceleration, and he's through. And number four, Neil Facey, follows him through. So that gives us this situation right now with 9.50 still up the front, but not too far behind. We've got 63, Phil White. Here he is with Neil Facey chasing in third place. And as Barry said, he's got a clear run now ahead of him. He can look down the straight and see ahead of him the uh, 950 car, the target that he's got to beat, it's very clear, there's no back markers in his way. There we are, that's the man, that red car, we can just see, just there, that's the one he's got to catch, and that's the amount of ground he's got to make up. He's driving nice and smoothly, but number four, Neil Facey, young Neil Facey, goes very well throughout the year. He also races 150 mile an hour Thunder Saloon cars, but he never seemed to get it together in the World Final night. It looks as though he's got it together in this one. He's harassing, he's all over the 63 car of Phil White like a rat. He's now nearly touching him. He's just waiting for Phil to make that little tiny mistake and nip through, then he'll make the charge on the Royal Mail car. Right, well, let's just see what's going to happen here, because don't we mustn't... Uh underestimate the task 950 Norman Wilsey in the lead is going very well he's got a substantial lead he's not an easy driver to get past he's cool calm collected um, he's a grandfather he's got a certain uh, maturity and experience of course he's not going to get flustered and he's undoubtedly keeping looking in his mirror to see how far Phil White uh, is behind and of course winning in consecutive years is not a common feature of National Hot Rod World Championships Barry did it in 73 and 74 and again in 77 and 78 and they're the only two occasions uh, in the history of the event that one man has won the race in two consecutive years and that's what Phil White would have to do if he's going to get past. There's one hell of a battle now for about 6-7 and place, uh, place, oh he's done it, he's gone around the outside, the 718 car 
has been tailing the 134 car for about the last eight laps, Nigel. 134 car, it's obvious his tyres have gone off. And you've now got another world champion, 962, Ormond Christie, trying to go around the back of the 134 car. If he can do it now, he's still within a chance of catching the leading group. OK, action all the way. 134, Nigel Smith on the inside. Ormond Christie having a go now on the outside. He's got the legs up as he comes out of that turn. And he, if he can just take his ground as he comes off this bend, yep. He's got it in the middle of the bend, he does it, in fact. So there we are, another another change further back. So we're certainly getting a lot of chopping and changing of, uh, of places in this one. But at the moment, there's no chopping and changing up front. 950 is still there on his own. And he's got that very, very comfortable lead. If we just see now how wide this gap is. Here's 950 in the lead. There's one back marker between him. There we are, there's the leader. On the right of the picture, one back marker, the white car, and uh, the others are coming up through. Here we are. He's actually got Nigel five seconds lead now, and he's pulling out of about a quarter of a second per lap on Phil White there. Here's Phil White coming round the outside of that back marker car. And that's the man he's chasing. We just got a glimpse at the end of the straight. He's certainly still got a great deal to do, and I think 63 has got to find a lot more speed if he's really going to be on terms with 950 at the end of this race. Of course, he's got the added complication that he's being harassed all the time uh, by Neil Facey in the number four car. He can't afford any mistakes at all, so he's got two things to worry about. He's got to worry about going round as quickly as he possibly can to catch 950, but he can't afford to take too many chances in case he lets number four come through to take second place from him. 950 now, Nigel, has got the back markers to contend with. He's gone past one very, very easily, but he's still got problems that will slide up a little bit, but I must say this is one of the best hot rod fun. Look at that! He went past it as if he's got jungle juice in there, not petrol, and can't be unleaded. It's really going beautifully, no doubt about that at all. 950, superb driving, and he's now got, let's have a look, he's got basically the length of a straight. The length of a straight is the distance, and as we look at the lap sheets, we're coming up now, we're on lap 49, so there'll be 25 laps to go, which is still quite a long way, and still time for Phil White to do something, but he's going to have to do something pretty spectacular if he's going to get up on terms with the leader. So let's just give you a run through then now on the 50 lap marker, it's... Uh, 9.50, Norman Wolsey the leader, 63, Phil White is in second place. In third position is car number four, Neil Facey. Then we've got 7.18 is next, Colin White. We move back to six, Stephen Dance, 9.62, Ormond Christie, 1.34, Nigel Smith. That's the rundown as we go into the final 25 laps with the... Uh, in fact, Norm Ormond Christie here coming up to get on terms with the number six car of Stephen Dance. But these two are still some way behind the leaders, still with 9.50, Norman Woolsey up front and well clear. Nigel, with 25 laps to go, I used to be able to think, OK, you just treat this as a final and you go for it. But Norman Woolsey, as you can see there in the 9.50 car, he's going so quickly that it's going to be virtually impossible to catch this man. Yeah, I mean, the back markers really don't seem to be holding him up. Here's the man who's got to catch him. This is the sort of hold-ups that you get. Phil White, desperate, of course, to make up ground on the leader. And every few seconds he gets held up uh, by the slower cars, waiting for a chance to go by. Uh, of course, here he's got himself boxed on the outside, and he can't get past, and he's wasted a lot of time all the way around that bend. And I think, as Barry said quite rightly, uh, Norman Wolsey now in 950 is going to take a very great deal of catching. Phil White has shaken off the, uh, the tail of Neil Facey for just a moment or two. He's got himself a little bit more space there. Uh, Neil Facey having his own little problems trying to get past one of the other back markers. So there's 63 Phil White on the left of the picture. At the bottom there is number four, Neil Facey, who I think is going to have to settle for third place in this unless something fairly spectacular happens. Let's now watch 950, Norman Woolsey, fighting his way past some of these slower cars. The cool approach as he comes up now behind the number eight car of Paul Grimer. Now, he's usually very hard to get by if you can remember Paul Grimer from the old days, but I think the way the 950 car there, Norman Woolsey's going, he'll go past him like a bit of silk. He's driving so smoothly there, look, just a little touch there, look. Now, why does the number eight go over? He is stupid, he's coming up to be lacked, he's looked at him, so he's seen him, you saw him look behind. Now, why the Christ say doesn't he pull over to the left and let Walsley go by? Let's see what happens then. We've got the two back markers in front, number eight on the outside, 21 on the inside. Well, 21 is that much slower, so that's not a problem. There's Norman Woolsey, look at that acceleration as he goes down the outside on this bend. 
and now he can shake them off and uh, put them between him and Phil White. As we look at the sheet, we're up to 60 laps now, 15 more to go for this driver from Porter Down in Northern Ireland, 9.50, Norman Woolsey, winner of this championship in 1986, in second place is 63, Phil White, third, number four, Neil Facey. Pulling away from Neil Facey, but he's actually just taken one second out, so he's slowly catching up uh, the lead car. But I think he's now tied up with backmarkers, and we are inside the car now. Now we've got backmarkers here, and now the car in front there is being lapped. He should pull over now to the left hand side, but he won't. He'll stay on the inside and make film around the outside, which is the quickest line if you can chop back. He's managed to overtake him there now. He's coming up behind Duffy Collard. Now, Duffy, world champion before, very, very good drive, but I guarantee you, yeah, let Phil go through on the inside. That's what I call professional and proper driving. People that have been there before will pull over and let the other faster guy go through. Take my hat off the Duffy. He's being sponsored actually by Jimmy Shabble for a thousand pounds for the Cambridge Children Hospice. If Duffy had won it this year, he was going to double that. So, number 19, good luck to him. He's putting all his prize money today and his start money, along with a thousand pounds from Jimmy Savile to the Children's Cambridge Hospice. Good luck to you, Ben. Still there. He can afford to wait a little. Phil White is getting closer in 63, but still there's a lot to do. And no doubt, uh, if this man here in this car we got too close, I'm sure we'd see Norman put his foot down a little more and pull himself to safety. There's three back markers there that Phil would have to get rid of. The red car just gone out of the picture is the one he's chasing. He's got to get past these three before he can even begin to get anywhere near. And I get the impression very much that Norman Woolsey has got something in hand if he really needs it. He definitely has. He hasn't been driving that hard. He hasn't had to drive that hard. When I say that, he popped in one of the quickest laps that have been round in switch and the car set up for it. Four more laps to go. Number eight, Grimer. Phil White has just gone past Grimer again. Once again, the mobile to take that Grimer. So, as we come to three more now, the Ulsterman going superbly on the inside. Here he is, just picking off a few more of the back markers. Coming up now, uh, just going past the 413 car of Roger Peck. But uh, he can, should be able to sail past there. He's going to get boxed up for a moment or two behind 134, but it's no real problem. The one-lap marker goes out now for Norman Woolsey. He's on his final lap. It's no problems for him at all. Phil White is well a little way back in 63, but this man is coming around to take it now. Into the final turn he comes. 9.50, Norman Woolsey, the mail arrives on time. Over the line he goes. Norman Woolsey is the 1989 National Hot Rod Champion of the World. The defending title holder wasn't good enough to catch him. 63, Phil White has to settle for second place. And a great drive from the car, number four, Neil Facey, comes home third. I thought I'd lost it when the race had been stopped because I think it was in 87 here when the race was stopped. That's when I ended up losing it, but everything went well in the day. Phil, a good drive, an eventful drive for you, but we just heard after the stewards' inquiry you've been dropped from second to fourth place because of that incident with Mark Jones. What's your verdict? It's dead, they're the stewards, they can do what they want. Did you feel they were justified? No, not at all, but then it's not down to me, they're the stewards, their rule stands, I'm fourth, I'm fourth. It's what, as simple as that. What was your interpretation of the incident? Um, I went up the inside of him, I think. To be truthful, he kept his foot in where I was up the inside of him. He probably was on the dust. I mean, it was very dusty on the outside for the first 30 laps. Bit of cement, I don't know, but I'm fourth. Bad luck, but it was a good drive. Some great pictures from your car, incidentally. But the, the guy who won it, he was a difficult one. Oh, yes, he's going. He deserved every bit of it. He's driving very good. His car very quick. Can't take anything away from him. It's his day. So, definitely a case of first class delivery there as the world title goes back to Northern Ireland for the fifth time in nine years. The highlight of this speed weekend here at Foxhall Stadium. Well, next week we move north into Norfolk to Sandringham for carriage driving, where the atmosphere is probably a little bit different from here, but uh, it's probably a collar and tie job for some of us. You never know who you might meet. Look forward to seeing you then. Goodbye.